Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. We've got a lovely returning guest today. Who have we got, Alex? Yeah, we have. And this kind of makes up for the fact that this is day five in a podcast marathon uh, in which we are now losing the will to live. So we have Charlie White with us again today. Yay! She did a brilliant podcast on Marilyn Monroe a few weeks back and you all loved it. So uh, instead of putting on her pub hat and taking a piss, which is what we do every week in the Mary Rose, she's come back to do some more Hollywood history with us. Hey, Charlie. Hello. How are we? Uh, Yeah, we're running on fumes now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh god yes oh, oh my goodness i am actually gonna bake that danish dream cake today that nicola told us about just so i can shove cake in my face oh can you send me some because i think i'm gonna end up in bed after all of this no no hey, cake is never a bad thing guys just keep yeah going. No. Cake, cake is the answer to all woes. So, Charlie, uh, we touched very briefly on this subject before, and we were like, wow, that should make a whole podcast. Yes. So, tell everyone what we're going to talk about today. Yes, um, I'm putting on my film student hat again and using my expensive degree to tell you all about the story of Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. And it's a real Hollywood story, 1930s, a lot of glamour. This is going to be really good because my knowledge of Clark Gable is pretty much, I know he's in that last Marilyn Monroe film uh, and I know he's got a pencil moustache and I know he says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And that's about <laughs> it. Yeah, uh, mine is exactly the same as Alex's, so I'm pretty looking forward to learning more about this. Definitely. Um, <laughs> so who was Clark Gable? Is that his real name? And what do we know about his early life? Okay, well, it it was part of his real name. He was born William Clark Gable on the 1st of February 1901 in Cadiz, Ohio. Um, His father worked fitting pipes for oil rigs, which is all the sort of, it feels very Americana. And Clark helped him out for a while before realising that that really wasn't the life for him. He spent most of his free time in the theatre and by 17 he joined a travelling troupe of actors and he was helping to build sets and doing the kind of small roles that were offered to him, you know, just getting by. But part of his travelling took him, you know, all over the country and he met a lady called Josephine Dillon who was a theatre manager. She took him on as an acting coach. She saw something in him. Um, And at this point, it's interesting because Gable's story becomes remarkably like Marilyn Monroe's, only in a gender reverse role. Josephine Dillon took him under under her wing. She paid to have his teeth fixed. She tamed his hair because he had really sticky out ears. And so she sort of tamed it long to grow and cover them a bit. She fed him up because he was really skinny. She trained his voice so it was a lower register and a bit more manly. Then she married him and took him to Hollywood. (laughs) I love this. Now you're acceptable and I will marry you. (laughs) Yes. I mean, I, I have to mention she was 17 years his senior. So this is an older woman taking the young ingenue under her wing. And it was her who got him to drop the William from the start of his name and he became Clark Gable. We hear this story a hundred times over with an older man taking on a young starlet. Mm. Um, so it's really interesting to see it in the reverse with, um, with now Clark Gable. You know what? That gives me a bit of hope uh, that I could... Sorry, did I interrupt? I just not I was just going to say, it's, it's pretty much grooming, isn't it? It's a bit creepy. <laughs> I was going to say it gives a bit of hope that I could might might date not 17 years my junior obviously that's a bit out of the way but you know could possibly date a younger man hey there's nothing wrong with that girls nothing at all <laughs> although you are we are at the age now where if they were 17 years our junior they'd still be legal and as my best friend from school is always keen on saying uh, if there's grass on the pitch let's play <laughs> oh my god really <laughs> yeah mate she is like home of, she, she was known to utter very loudly at Chelsea a great comment about the fact that she could still get in a size 12 if they were maternity pants and it would just be easy access for Eden Hazard oh my goodness this is yeah. this has gone in a whole different direction <laughs> yeah let's go back to Clark Gable before we end up going way too far down this road um, oh. so she's groomed him and everything and taken him to Hollywood Yes. What happens next? Well, she's taken him to Hollywood in 1924 and really he's not impressing anybody. Hollywood didn't see his appeal. He played the extra a few times and some people say that there are films that if you squint and you know have a magnifying glass, you might see him in the background. But no, that was it. He left Hollywood with nothing. I 
that's kind of sad, really. Do you know, sometimes you just got to try, haven't you? God loves a trier. But um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Gable's time. And he left Hollywood shortly after. So Kelly Clarkson did that. <laughs> no, seriously, she went to LA when she was like a teenager, was yeah. an extra in two things. And then her apartment burnt down. So she went back to Texas. Oh, my goodness. Then, so, yeah. God. Wow. So where does Carol Lombard fall into the story? Well, at the same time, of the, about 1924, she was being signed up at the age of 16 to a contract at 20th Century Fox. She was doing really well. She was still using her, made, her given name, which was Alice Jane Peters. Her mother had moved her three children to L.A. from Indiana after she separated from their father. And Alice was a really sporty child and got spotted playing baseball at the age of 13 and was offered the role of a in a silent movie which she absolutely nailed i mean this is only in hollywood stuff right she screen tested for charlie chaplin and though she didn't get that particular role she got a part in a western called hearts and spurs which was a massive hit and led to more western roles for her oh it sounds terrible i know (laughs) yeah she she was doing i mean this is the thing with hollywood it is an industry it's a machine and at that time with the studios if you've got something that's working you just keep churning them out so she'd been good in a western they kept making westerns with her she changed her name to the more exotic sounding carol lombard um but she got in an accident At the age of 17, she was out on a date with some guy and their car crashed. She was in the passenger seat and shattered glass flew into the left side of her face. Not great when you're making a career out of your face. She was given emergency plastic surgery, but it left her face completely immobile for months and Fox dropped her. I mean, what are they going to do with this damaged starlet? I, I don't know what to say. That's that's really it's harsh. I can see why, but mm. that's I kind of feel that her, career, her obviously her career doesn't go down the pan. But at this point, I feel that you know that's the end. But it's not, is it? It's not the end for her. We'll we'll be coming back to Carol Lombard's story a little later. But this is this is dual narrative stuff because we've got the two of them, um, both both trying to make it in Hollywood against all the odds here. Um, and we really need to get back to Clark Gable's story at this point. Yeah, so how does he get back to Hollywood? <laughs> hard work, hard work and tenacity. He went back on the road with his travelling troupe of actors and he became something of a, a local level matinee idol wherever he went. So, you know, he's a handsome guy. He wound up on stage in Texas and he caught the eye of a lady called Rhea Langham. She was a wealthy divorcee, again, 20 years his senior. Can you see where this is going? She became obsessed with him. He divorced Josephine Dillon, married Rhea Langham and suddenly found himself with a completely unlimited amount of resources with which to have another crack at Hollywood. Rhea Langham was minted. She was really, really wealthy. <laughs> Call me cynical, but <laughs> Clark, yeah. come on, man. You know, yeah, you could, you could perhaps say, but in 1930, she financed a play for her husband to star in in Hollywood called The Last Mile. And she arranged for the press to attend and he, he got good reviews. So, you know, fair play to him. He must have had some talent. So the good reviews turned into um, studio executives coming along and looking at him. And he very nearly got cast in Little Caesar at Warner Brothers. But Jack Warner hated the look of him. He said it was all the years. He said he looked like a taxi cab with both its doors left open. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) that's harsh, man. (laughs) Isn't it? It really is. But, you know, it's there's a lot of big studios in Hollywood and MGM were in need of leading men. They needed alpha men. They got plenty of old stars that they drafted in from the theatres and plenty of the kind of, shall we say, gamma types that you could take home to meet your nan. But what Louis B. Mayer saw in Clark Gable was a leading man with animal magnetism, rough and ready. This was the kind that he needed. He got cast as the man's man and the studio taught him how to hunt, how to fish, how to ride horses, all things that he'd never done before but he did for publicity photos and then ended up loving. This is when Carol comes back into the picture though, doesn't she? Yes, it is. It is. So roughly around this time, you know, the industry is changing. 
in Hollywood in so many ways. But the big thing is talking pictures, synchronized sound. Um, silent films just aren't going to cut it anymore. And studios needed actors who could do speaking roles. Carol Lombard had a great voice. So this is really, really good. She'd not been idle while Gable was making waves. She'd recovered enough from her accident to be able to cover her scar with makeup and lighting. It's very hard to see it ever, I'll be honest with you. She'd worked with a comedy legend by the name of Max Sennett. Um, and she learned the physicality of comedy, you know, um, slapstick, uh, over-exaggeration, that kind of thing. It found it really suited her. She was, she was naturally exuberant. She had a very funny character. So this was, this was all kind of very natural to her. And when you pair this with her ability to speak lines, it made her a really hot property. And in 1930, when Clark Gable's coming in to do his, his play and getting seen, she was signed to Paramount Studios. They didn't really know what to do with her. So they lent into her glamour. And again, like I say, you really can't see the scar on her face. So if you're imagining some sort of Phantom of the Opera deal here, it's a tiny, tiny scar and covered with makeup. She starred in five films that were released in 1931, and two of them were opposite William Powell, who was going to become her first husband. I like this. First <laughs> husband. One of how many? You can't just <laughs> have one in Hollywood, can you? No. What's no. the magic number, by the way? Do we know? <laughs> oh, no well, idea. Well, Liz Taylor had more husbands than Henry VIII had wives. So she she did very well as Taylor. <laughs> she did. So they both suffer heartache before they meet, don't, don't they? They do. I mean, you know, William Powell was quiet and refined and Carol Lombard was not at all. He was 38 and she was 22, which is not, you know, it's not a ridiculous age gap. But when one partner wants to sit in and is, has kind of done all of the Hollywood party scene and the other one hasn't and wants to go out and drink and party, Carol Lombard could famously swear like a sailor and she was not at all refined. So there's this big chasm between the two of them. Meanwhile, Clark Gable is making himself notorious at MGM for shagging his way through his leading ladies. He was physically incapable of refusing an actress if she offered him a go. And he had an affair with Joan Crawford, who he starred with a couple of times. But this was going too far for the studio because she was married to Douglas Fairbanks Jr. at the time. And that's Hollywood royalty. And you don't mess with that. So he gets sent over on loan to Paramount as a punishment. And it was there in 1932 that he starred opposite Carol Lombard for the only film they ever appeared in together called No Man of Her Own. Was it love at first sight? No. <laughs> Their working relationship was strictly professional. Uh, it was even friendly. She presented him with a ham that she'd have with his face on it for being such a hammy actor. I think it was bad timing, if I'm honest. Um, it's harsh, honest. though, like if you're the only bird he won't sleep with. <laughs> well, I think there was two, two reasons for it. One, um, he is being on best behaviour because he's just been sent off for having an affair with Joan Crawford. And Carol Lombard was actually married at the time. They, well, ish, she divorced William Powell after just two years of marriage. They were completely incompatible, um, but they stayed friends and they worked together, but their marriage was done completely. Um, Gable couldn't behave himself for long, though. So after he's made the film with Carol Lombard and, and that's kind of kind of done, he stars with Jean Harlow in Red Dust, which is this wonderfully pre-code romantic comedy he's not shaved, she's not wearing a bra, you know, it's, it's real kind of the stuff that would be banned for many, many years in Hollywood. Um, and he had an affair with Gene Harlow, of course. He got himself loaned out again. <laughs> Please, can't It's the same as like if you piss off your club at football, like if you, yeah. like the guy at Chelsea who bought an air rifle to training ended up loaned out to fucking Bradford or whatever. Yeah. It's, do you know what? It, it really is. It's, it's the ultimate way of, of punishing them. So they loaned him out to Columbia, but he landed on his feet there because he got a role in Frank Capra's It Happened One Night, which earned him his only Best Actor Oscar. Uh, so he did quite well out of that and simultaneously completely destroyed the undershirt industry. 
in one scene because he he took off his shirt and he wasn't wearing an undershirt so men decided well if clark gable's not wearing an undershirt and that's sexy i'm going to be sexy like clark gable just so. briefly interlude on the fact that i kind of understand that not wearing a bra thing sounds so hollywood old hollywood uh-huh. and sort of judgmental and morally stupid but the shaving thing did people have to be clean shaven i don't think it wasn't a case of you have to be clean shaven but the when the when the Hayes code came in one of the things that they were very explicit about was that you the hero should be a hero you should be able to tell who the good people were and who the bad people were and the good people should be rewarded and the bad people should be punished so having a hero who's kind of dirty that sort of anti-hero type became a real a bit of an anomaly in during those years of of the Hayes code so yeah it's it was a sort of really it was very charged sexually red dust and um those films of the early 30s are some of them are really quite hot and really walking a very thin line between what what would be appropriate later on and, and what we're used to seeing now so and then the fun police came along the fun police did come along unfortunately but hey you know sometimes rules are a good thing because it made it made directors and writers um be creative so you know we got some great stuff out of the code so i'm not knocking it completely um at this time carol lombard was doing really well as well so she's ma- she's making a really big name for herself she starred opposite john barrymore who is uh, drew barrymore's granddad i believe in a film called 20th Century. And in that film, she basically invented the female lead in a screwball comedy and created this whole new niche for herself with an emphasis on clever dialogue, um, delivering it with, with humour and elements of physical comedy. So she was, she was doing really well at this time as well. When does it change from being not the right time to being the right time for these two? Do you, we're still we're still not there yet guys you know no you way you you want the romance and you want it now but i'm sorry i've got more heartache for you <laughs> um, well alina will be happy because she's yeah history, so well, this is where it gets really dark I don't <laughs> alina know does it. dark well <laughs> <laughs> so now it gets dark on both sides so carol lombard was in love with a crooner called russ colombo who died in this freak accident when a friend was showing him a civil war gun and it went off into Russ Colombo's head. I mean, this is just... You like... say that, but my uncle did that in the Afghan war and ended up having to marry the guy's ugly sister as an apology. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. They had five kids. Like... They were very happy, but the okay. father was like, you have come to me, you've apologised. I can accept that it was an accident, but now you've got to take this ugly daughter off my hands. Wow. People, so it happens. Yeah. Be wary of guns. You may be marrying an ugly man or woman. So Don't play with firearms. Is the moral of the story. Do not have guns in the house. It's just a bad idea. So no. she mourned him for months. She was. Uh, she really did love him. And some people say that you know, if if he'd lived, he would have been the love of her life. Um, so yeah, she was really upset. Gable again. What do you think he's up to? He's still fiddling around with his leading ladies. And he has an affair with an actress called Loretta Young, which takes a really sinister turn when she falls pregnant. Now, this is, again, studio system days. So she refused the abortion that was offered to her by the studio and took option B instead. And this was option B. She went away to have her baby in Missouri, giving the child up to a local orphanage under an agreement that she could return and stage a fake adoption. I mean, this is this Machiavelli kind of level of stuff. 20 months later, Hollywood star Loretta Young visited an orphanage in Missouri and was so moved that she adopted a girl on the spot, her own daughter. The girl grew up um, and was named Judy Lewis. She became an actress and she didn't find out who her father was until she was 31 and her father was dead. Her mother admitted the truth to her after, you know, because there'd been rumours, it'd been a long-standing rumour. Um, and she said, you know, come on, tell me, is this true? Is Clark Gable my father? And Loretta Young replied, yes, you are my sin. Oh, that's horrible. Dark, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. But it's Too yeah. dark even for Alina. Yeah, I mean, f- psychologically, God, that must have screwed her up. Oh, she wrote a book about it, actually. I've not read it, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I can't. I mean, if you look at her, she apparently, as a child, she had her ears surgically pinned back 
she's because she looked she's you could tell she's clark gable's daughter she's got it's like so the extra nervous. slap in the face i don't know who my dad is but he gave me these ears <laughs> bless her heart yeah but you know this is how the studios worked they had to protect their stars and the perceived morality of their stars at all costs and you can't have an unwed pregnant star and you certainly can't have her unwed and pregnant by a married leading actor this is just not going to happen i mean hollywood's still massively hypocritical isn't it it's just in different ways now yeah i think they they don't have quite the power that they have now and also society's changed a lot you know if if you were if you weren't married and you got pregnant you know it's not it's not the end of the world that it would be in the 1930s but i'll give you some romance though shall i do you want do you want to lighten it up let's do yes. it let's Please. do it Okay, so Gable and Lombard meet again in January 1936 at Hollywood's glittering Mayfair Ball. So just imagine the glitz and the glamour of 1936 Hollywood. It's gorgeous. They realised they'd got a lot in common and they hit it off. And he even loved her filthy mouth, which made itself famously apparent after a few drinks. Yeah, I think Alina and I are still waiting for that bloke to come along, aren't we? <laughs> oh, God, where is he? Where, if you're listening... Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> if you love a girl who swears like a sailor, get in touch. Yeah, pretty at, much. At history. <laughs> they started having an affair. Um, they had an affair in, in plain sight, really. Uh, they met in hotels, at friends' second homes. He would even sneak into her home by crawling in through the back garden. But they couldn't meet at his place because, uh, hang on, wait, he's still married. The publicity department at MGM managed to keep the affair out of the public eye and Carol Lombard did a great job of feeding the press loads of interviews and photo shoots. At this time, she was really in high demand. She'd renegotiated her contract at Paramount and became the highest paid actor in Hollywood by 1937. Now, that's not the highest paid actress for a girl, you know, oh, aren't you doing well? She was the highest paid actor of all of them in Hollywood. That's amazing because there's no, there's, I mean, there's still a massive gender gap in Hollywood. Yeah, huge. And plus the idea of being, essentially she was a freelancer, which didn't happen. She was in that much demand that she was able to renegotiate her contract, that she could work at any studio she chose. She had approval of director. She had approval of publicity, of cinematographer, of makeup and hair. She was really bossing it. This is remarkable. I mean, I, I can't stress enough how, how phenomenal this makes Carol Lombard as a human being at this time to have done that mm. she really is bossing it isn't she <laughs> she is and they were getting away with it as well which is all good so they're happily boffing away um <laughs> but sinister events were on the horizon as in world war Two. should we quickly touch on what happened with the two actors in world war Two? Mm. yeah okay so we need to say that before before world war Two they did manage to get married. Um, but the only way that they managed to get married was by Clark Gable doing a film he didn't want to do called Gone with the Wind. You might have heard of it. Um, he did not want to do that film. But Louis B. Mayer said, I understand you need quite a lot of money and I will pay for your divorce. Because Rhea Langham's kind of gone, hang on, you've been screwing around on me for years. I'm not letting you get away easy. Yeah, been... you owe me, rat bag. You owe me big for years of humiliation anyway did the film got a bucket of cash got divorced and on the 29th of march 1939 clark gable and carol lombard were married they moved into a ranch in encino california and you know everything looked perfect but the marriage was having its problems okay because they got together with this whole clandestine thrill of love making in secret and it turned out they really missed the element of danger when they got married so they started booking hotel rooms under pseudonyms and shagging in public you know doing whatever you can to keep the spark alive not that clark gable ever experienced any problem getting his leg over without his wife but that's another story and then the war so yes the war happens which is all very exciting, but Hollywood do not want to get involved in politics at all, okay? At the beginning of the war, Hollywood was strictly, strictly neutral because Germany was a big customer and you don't upset big customers. However, Carol Lombard was amongst many in town who felt very differently looking at 
global politics and felt that something had to be done. So she sought out a starring role in a film called To Be or Not To Be, which was Ernest Lubish's light black comedy with Nazis. Now, Uh. (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I mean, this is, it's fantastic. It's the story of a theatrical troupe in Poland who are confronted with the Nazi invasion. And it's a tale of acting, ego, vanity, against the bigger global picture it's so funny it's so complex and if anyone's going to look up any film following on from this to be or not to be from 1942 um that's the film to watch i'm writing this down right now by the way you you'll love it alina um it was lubish was a german exile like many people who were working in hollywood at the time um and felt very strongly about what he saw happening in Europe. Um, But the reviews were really mixed because some people thought, actually, you can't satirise what's happening in Warsaw at the time. And um, Lubich responded and said, you know, what I've satirised here is uh, the Nazis and their ridiculous ideology. I've also satirised the attitude of actors who remain actors regardless of how dangerous the situation may be, which I believe is a true observation. So it's, it's fantastic. It's really, really, really worth watching. Hollywood eventually gets dragged into the war when America does, so after Pearl Harbor, um, and they decide the best way that they can help is by sending its stars out to raise money and support for the war effort. Carol Lombard became the best salesperson ever, of course, because she bosses everything. And she raised loads of money through speaking at rallies and selling war bonds to ordinary people who would part with their cash to have a look at her, really, to come and see her talk. On the 15th of January, 1942, she appeared in her home state of Indiana, all wrapped in furs, beautiful, and she gave a rousing speech which earned $2 million for the war effort in one single day. When her work was done, she was in a big hurry to get home to her husband. So what happens to Carol? Okay, well, like I said, she's, not, she's in a hurry to get home to Clark Gable. And there are two versions of this story at this point, but both involve his leading lady, Lana Turner. One story goes that Lombard suspected him of playing around and wanted to get home to keep tabs on him. The other is that they had had a blazing row in which Gable had refused to give his wife the satisfaction of denying that he was sleeping with Lana Turner before she left, which made her leave in the middle of a fight. That story then goes that they made up over the phone and that she wanted to hurry home to make up with him in person. So she was so desperate to get home from Indiana that she decided to fly rather than take the train as they planned. Um, she got her mother with her and her mother was terrified of flying. So Carol flipped a coin with her mother and she won. On the 16th of January, 1942, their plane crashed into the side of the Spring Mountains outside Las Vegas. There were 22 passengers, including 15 soldiers from the US Army on board and no survivors. She was 33 years old when she died. Uh, that's tragic. She's at like the height of her power and everything, isn't she? She really was. It was, it's just such a sad story. Eddie Mannix, who is MGM's Mr. Fix-It for stars who are in need of help, called Clark Gable to tell him that there'd been an accident. Uh, And both men travelled to the foot of the mountains. The crash site was completely inaccessible by car. So Mannix and a few others hiked up the side of the building while Clark Gable sat in the Pioneer Saloon, which is still there, and drank while waiting for some news. It takes about five hours to get up to the crash site, doesn't it? It does. It's, a, it's an incredible... I mean, there's, I'll share a link on Twitter so that you can actually see someone going up to the crash site. People still visit it today. It's, it's an incredible thing. Just twisted metal. So when the search party came back from that, massive hike they couldn't offer any kind of comfort to clark gable because they hadn't found anything much more than twisted metal he mannix could only offer clark gable the only thing he had found was a fragment of a ruby brooch that he'd given to his wife on their wedding day as evidence of her death and that was it so clark gable did what any grieving man would do he fell apart completely picked himself up and enlisted (laughs) <laughs> that's right i mean uh, if you want yeah 
<laughs> yeah. Revenge on the war, go get it. Exactly. For a lot of people, when they saw news of Carol Lombard's death, for a lot of Americans, that was the first indirect American civilian big name death of the war because you know, she'd been traveling with with servicemen the reason they crashed into the mountains was probably because you, they weren't lit like they should have been properly lit because everything's kind of blacked out so she was a big a big death for them but Clark Gable enlisted like I say and he enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army Air Corps and went into officer training so he didn't just jump in at the top because he was a big star how does World War II pan out for him? Well, Major Clark Gable, he mm. trained as a gunner and he flew on a few bombing raids. So he did actually see active service. But the army did have to stand him down um, after not too long because he was Hitler's favourite actor. And there was... <laughs> Dubious accolade. <laughs> I know. Well, there were... <laughs> if you're going to have a, fav a favourite Hollywood actor, I can't blame the guy. He was Mr. Hollywood. Uh, but the army were very concerned, as, as you would be, that his presence was putting his unit at extra risk. They actually worried that Hitler might have wanted to capture Clark Gable and keep him on display or something like that. Imagine oh himself. I just had to put him in the Berlin Zoo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, oh, but after the war, Gable made some more movies, but he'd aged dramatically as you imagine that he would have, you know, having lived through what he'd lived through. And um, someone said, which I thought was quite, quite wise, that having really loved and really lost and gone through that, it must have been very hard for him to play at it, um, sort of you know, to play that lover on screen and play that he was in mortal danger when he had been in mortal danger and it must have been very difficult for him but he did keep working and he stayed on he stayed on the ranch he stayed on their Encino ranch throughout two more marriages he married twice more after Carol Lombard until his death at the age of 59 in November 1960. So he too was one of his later roles was with Marilyn Monroe wasn't it? Yes, he died weeks after the wrap of The Misfits with Marilyn Monroe. He, he'd done all of his own stunts in that film, despite having recovered from two heart attacks already. He was jumping on horses, jumping off horses, riding horses. It was very, very macho stunts that he did in that film. And he, he was adamant that he'd do them himself. And he died of a heart attack. So, yeah, probably not... Um, not unsurprising i would say he should have taken it easier really he might still be well not still be here now but maybe <laughs> he'd be 119 he might he might have had a he might have had a few more years but hey look i mean this is this is clark gable he was the big the big man's man the big actor on screen i think he went out the way that he probably would have wanted to mm. ways. i don't think he would have would have wanted to sit in and be quiet i don't know who knows? But his widow, Kay, she respected his wishes when he died and his body was interred next to Carol Lombard's and they remain side by side to this day. It's got to be harsh if you're one of the later wives, hasn't it? You know, you're just <laughs> the, the consolation prize. It's, it had to be difficult for them because they were in many ways of a similar type. They were petite, blondes. They had a kind of Carol Lombard feel to them if you like in, in the way that they looked so but you know hey everyone's got a type what are you gonna do just a bad copy really <laughs> yeah I mean it can't be it can't be easy because like I say they were they were clearly very in love um, despite Clark Gable's behavior maybe he would have maybe he would have stopped it and maybe he wasn't having an affair with Lionel Turner he might not have been and I quite like that idea that maybe she accused him of it and he just said you know i'm not i'm not saying anything if you think i'm doing this that's bad enough i'm not going to justify this with an answer 
But then wonder if it's a bit like Edward the Seventh, whereby <laughs> because he was such a slut bag at one yeah. point or many points, every woman he ever brushed up against gets added to the list. <laughs> I don't think you're, you're far wrong in that. But then he did have previous, and mm. she was right to be. She was right to be nervous and to um, to suspect him. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so what do you think is their legacy as a couple in terms of Hollywood history? I think their legacy is is one of a you know they were the epitome of 1930s Hollywood glamour. She's the beloved comedian. He's the ultimate manly leading man. They made sense. In fact, when news started to hit the press that they were having an affair, whereas you would have expected people to say this is awful, this is adultery on his side, this is terrible. Actually, the public kind of went, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. That's kind of cute. So they they fit together really nicely. I don't know what their their love affair would have been had she lived, but this incredible tragic end and his reaction to that um, is is just really beautiful. This should be a movie in itself. I'm kind of furious that it's not. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it isn't. That's just this is my point of reference for everything. Let's just hope it's better than The Crown. <laughs> well, this is not like people doing really over the top impressions of Carol <laughs> Lombard and yeah. Clark Gable so that well, you just cringe all the way through it if there's one thing that Hollywood loves it's films about itself it yeah. loves it I mean if you know this is this is Oscar worthy stuff here and plus every time I look at George Clooney I think seriously get this he should have been playing Clark Gable years ago really we're pushing it now bless him I love him but you know like I say Clark Gable died at 59 so it's not like mm. you can be an old Clark Gable um so I just I wish that they get it together I don't know maybe I should sit down and write it but yeah. it's got everything it's got sex it's got glamour it's got the war perfect maybe for next week down the pub with the uh, history's greatest love affair you should do uh, Hollywood's love affair with itself <laughs> yeah that'd be amazing hey well you know this is why they've made a star is born like four times they love yeah. a film about themselves um <laughs> so best film about hollywood at this time is still singing in the rain perfect about the transition to talking films it's it's just perfect in every detail Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. That was that was so insightful. I absolutely love the story of Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. This kind of story that doesn't start at love at first sight as you always would think so, but ends up a really sad but powerful story at the end. Mm. So thank you. No, thank you for having me. As a wiser man than I said, the course of true love never did run smooth. This is true. Or it never got started in my case or really this case <laughs> yeah, um i think everyone <laughs> yeah i think you should take uh, singing in the rain and perhaps come up with four more critical films in hollywood history that show the development of of the history of cinema and we'll oh have to yeah to do that yeah no problem so that'll be a joy <laughs> just don't pick the patriot because that just didn't it didn't go down with the <laughs> greatest war film debate oh, although yeah. it was very funny yeah that was a that was clearly a joke suggestion no one likes the patriot <laughs> and yet still didn't come last <laughs> join us tomorrow when we will be talking all about notable assassinations in history and that's with the assassinations podcast so don't miss out on that one don't forget that we do exist on patreon as History Hack, and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. Join us tomorrow when we will be talking... Join us tomorrow when we will be talking all about notable assassinations in history. And that's with the Assassinations podcast, so don't miss out on that one.